everyone. Uh, welcome to Data Byte number 134, Origins of Trust and Safety, featuring Alexander McGillivray, also known as AMAC, and Nicole Wong. My name is Robin Kaplan. I'm a researcher here at Data and Society, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, supported by my team behind the curtain, CJ, Eli, Rigo, and Angie. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can learn more about us through our website at datasociety.net. So before we begin, um, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community on whose land Data and Society was founded and what we now refer to as New York City, and the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. Acknowledgements hold us accountable to committing to the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. They center questions that include, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did, what did it take for us to get here? And how can we address our part in that history? I also ask you to join me in recognizing the activists protesting in the streets, in city council meetings, in workplaces, and around the kitchen table to support black liberation and to end racism in all its forms. And now a little more about our speakers today. Alexander McGillivray, or AMAC, was Deputy General Counsel at Google, General Counsel of Twitter, Deputy Chief Technology Officer under Obama, and co-founded the Trust and Safety Professional Association and the Trust and Safety Foundation Project. He's also on the Data and Society Board. This is very important to know. Uh, Nicole Wong was VP and Deputy General Counsel at Google, Legal Director of Products at Twitter, and also served as Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the Obama Administration. So this data byte came to be from a Twitter conversation, um, as all great data bytes do. Um, Alex and Nicole had just written a blog post together that they published on Alex's blog, uh, Bricolor. Everybody should go check it out. Um, on the origin of the product council role. The post is a really interesting look at a lot of the early legal issues that tech platforms didn't even know they had to consider when creating new products for launch. So when they posted this, I had a million more questions that I like responded to his tweet about, um, not just on product council, but on the history of trust and safety more generally. So Alex suggested we do a data bite along with Nicole. And I'm really excited to get to speak with them uh, both today about the role of product council, but also about how it connects to trust and safety and other values and ethical concerns that platforms have to navigate. So we're just gonna get directly into this q and I wanna start uh, just by kind of centering this conversation um, and um, explaining a lot of the different terms that I'm already using. So you were both working for Google in the mid 2000s in different roles when you created the role of product council. Can you tell us a bit about uh, what, what you were first hired to do, how the job shifted and how the role of product council came to be? Uh, Alex, you got there first. Do you want to start with what you started with? Um, sure. Uh, so I had been, um, I was lucky to go to law school at Harvard Law School. Um, there I was helping Jonathan Zetrain teach a couple classes on internet law. And Google's basic pitch to me is, was, why don't you come in and you can just do everything that was on your syllabus in the internet law class. Um, and you can do that, you know, for real at uh, Google, which at the time was a small but growing search company, really only had search. Um, and I was very excited about that prospect. Um, and the title that they had for me was IP counsel at the time, uh, which never really fit. And I joined uh, Google about three months or so after Alex did. And, and we, I think we, we must have both been in conversation with Google at the time. I had started uh, in the mid 90s as a First Amendment lawyer. So I mostly represented online publishers like the McClatchy Company and a number of the, the North, North American um, media publishers. Uh, and then when the commercial internet really started to take off in Silicon Valley, I started to inter represent sort of internet pure play clients like Yahoo and Hotmail before it was acquired by Microsoft and a number of others. Um, and that shift was for me sort of taking my First Amendment and media expertise and shifting it online. 
um, which, which is a lot of where my grounding comes from. Um, I was a partner at the law firm of Perkins Coie uh, and was pitching Google's uh, then general counsel, David Drummond, for like, hey, I could do some stuff with you on, on how to launch a product well. And he said, well, why don't you draft up a job description? Uh, so what I did was, uh, and, and come join us, and I, was, I, so I drafted up all the things I really loved to do and none of the things I really hated to do. Uh, and that eventually became the job that I took, which was called at the time Senior Compliance Counsel, because they had in this, their minds like, well, the product should be compliance. Um, and I think Alex and I at that point both kind of lobbied on saying like, nobody invites the person with compliance in their title to their product meeting. So we're going to have to realign the titles, which is how Product Council came to be named. Nicole's description also, uh, uh, finally, now I know why I kept being the employment lawyer, uh, even after she joined, until we had an employment lawyer. Because <laughs> nobody likes to do employment law, and Nicole wrote it out of her job description, so that's great. That's great. So, what, so what's the job of Product Council? What role do you play in the life cycle of product development for tech firms? And what are some of the issues that you, that you address? So I, I think it's a, the fundamental part of the job is that you get the product out the door in the most re robust and responsible way you can. So that's where the legal part comes in, but it matches to what is the, the product or the company mission. Um, and that, in, at least in the time that we started doing this, right, was a combination of the IP, um, trademark and copyright, not really so much the patents. We usually left those to the, the patent attorneys in the department, um, consumer protection, content regulation and privacy. Um, eventually, it, it started to include uh, competition um, as one of the components of, of doing it. But you're looking at that product, hopefully, from its very start of design and working with the teams to build it in, in a way that is both compliant and meets the needs of the specs of the, of the product um, and continue to help maintain it as it goes. It might be worth just adding that this is against the backdrop of the the opposite of that, like because that seems really reasonable. But the opposite of that, which was mostly going on, which was basically that the products were responsible for trying to figure out which legal issues they had, um, and then figuring out which lawyers were the specialists in those product issues. So you might be a product manager and say, "Oh, I I, have, I think I have a maybe a privacy issue," and then you would go find the privacy uh, lawyer. Uh, and work through that issue with the lawyer. Or you might think, oh, I, I might have a copyright issue. I think I, I should go to the copyright lawyer. Um, and so this was really a more, a more product-focused um, and at the end of the day, user-focused way of doing it going along. It's important to think through, like, I know that some of the people in the audience may be either product counsel now or, or thinking about becoming one, right? Like, part of the job is, like, you kind of need to know all the things or at least be able to spot them um, across that range and then, um, and if you're really doing it right, you not only understand sort of where you're positioned with the law, but also where that product is positioned in your company's roadmap and where your company and the product sit within the overall regulatory landscape. So that like it's multi-dimensional chess in terms of what does it take to get the best possible product out the door, um, which is super challenging uh, as both Alex and I have sort of experienced like a lot of sleepless nights on, but, but also one of the best parts of the job is being that close to it. And, and you're basically, you're trying to figure out all of the legal issues for legal issues that you haven't even necessarily considered yet um, as part of these products, which is interesting. So what's the difference between product counsel and trust and safety? Um, how, how do the two roles relate and how are they different? Yeah, the way, I, the way I think about trust and safety is uh, very much that these are the folks who are establishing what is okay and not okay on particular online environments. Uh, and that's both behaviors and content and actions. Um, there is a fair amount of overlap. Um, trust and safety tends to be non-lawyers, although there are a lot of great lawyers doing, doing trust and safety. And product counsel tend to be uh, lawyers, particularly if they're, uh, if they're doing the attorneying of a particular product. Um, but the, there is a lot of advising back and forth. Uh, there are people uh, within the trust and safety teams who really understand in a visceral way because they've been doing it for years and years and years and years, how products are likely to be abused. Um, so you would often go to them and say, oh, I'm working on this new product. How do you think it's gonna be abused? How do you think it will impact um, particular communities? That type of thing. Uh, and similarly, a trust and safety per person might say, oh, I'm trying to figure out a way to distinguish between 
this particular type of content and that particular type of content, I know that the law has tried to distinguish between those two types of content. Um, is there something that a product council might know that would be helpful there? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think they're so closely tied and we're one of the reasons I think that a lot of legal departments brought the trust and safety teams into the umbrella of legal is because they're, to me, the, the trust and safety folks are one of the most essential tools you have for risk management if you're the lawyer. And I think it's on two fronts, right? One is that, um, I used to tell my newspaper clients, like your best chance of avoiding a lawsuit is the first time you pick up the phone and, and hear the grievance of the person on the other side. That's your best shot. And that's what trust and safety is, is hearing the person on the other side, the user on the other side, tell you what's wrong with your product. That's a, actually super important risk mitigation part of, of, of any, any company. And then separate from that, and you see it come out in like, the transparency reports that a lot of the companies do now is you now have a dashboard of how is your product doing and so in terms of thinking about is my product flawed is some part of it failing which part of it is failing the the trust and safety teams reports on what are they hearing from the product they're like first responders in diagnosing what needs to get fixed um, and so sitting in the legal department i always found the trust and safety team one of my key go-to people um, uh, in, in terms of trying to diagnose what's going on with the product. So just a follow up from that then. So uh, is product council the ones that's actually changing the policy in the end? It, it really depends and different companies do this differently. Uh, my belief is that the people who are on the ground actually seeing this user interaction firsthand, the people who are closer to the facts, that those are the best people to also empower to change the policies. Um, but sometimes it'll be product council, sometimes it'll be trust and safety, at least in, in my experience. Um, and often, certainly the teams I worked with, we wanted to make sure that the trust and safety people were empowered not only to actually do the policy, um, but to just like the Toyota um, uh, you know, assembly chain, to be able to, to pull the cord and say, hey, this policy uh, doesn't make sense when it is applied to this particular uh, set of facts and people because um, uh, at the end of the day, there are real people at the end of the line. Um, and so we should do something different. And there had been a number of, of times when that ability to do something that was not our current policy and to reshape the policy because of the facts on the ground were extremely important. So beyond content concerns and trust and safety, what, what is, what's other work that's being done by Product Council? Um, that's often not thought about. I want to kind of expand our view um, of what we're thinking about the role being here. In the, in the trust and safety role, which um, I, I think is, is broader. I, right now, the current media focuses so much on content moderation. I think that's where a lot of the attention is, is and, and appropriately so, but there actually tends to be a whole spectrum of things and it depends a little bit on the company and its product, right? So I think if you, if you think about like what is trust and safety then the key question to deciding how do you organize and hire for that thing is well whose trust are you trying to earn and whose safety are you trying to protect and so content moderation might be one if you're a platform with a lot of, of, of content on it user content on it but there's also spam and fraud and there will be law enforcement requests or other requests for personal information um, and so, some companies include security of, of the product if that's a core part of their offering. So I think it will vary depending on the nature of the product that you're, you're trying to deliver. Yeah, no, another way that I think about it is um, often user support and trust and safety are somewhat similar. Uh, in user support, you really are trying to be as efficient as possible um, and you might sacrifice some of your um, efficacy by just being more efficient. In trust and safety, uh, I think it's the flip. Uh, often you're, you're, the decisions you're making are so important to the users and to the brand um, and as Nicole said to the risk of the company that you want to make sure you're doing it right as much as possible um, and you also want to be efficient but you you in general don't want to sacrifice um, efficacy for efficiency. So within your time at Google when did you both have to start considering content concerns as part of your role so what was the product and, and what were the some of the earliest concerns that you that you had to address 
maybe I'll go first on this one, Nicole, because I think my, I think mine predate yours. Um, for me, it was uh, in uh, 2000. I think it was 2002. Before I joined Google, I was an outside counsel, and Google had just uh, removed from web search uh, a site called Xenu.net, and that's X-E-N-U, which was a Scientology criticism site that was also publishing a bunch of the Scientology uh, secret texts. And the, um, the Scientologists were uh, well-known and extremely early adopters of DMCA uh, takedown notices. So these are copyright notices where you send um, an email or a letter uh, or a fax sometimes, <laughs> if we're unlucky, uh, to the platform saying that someone on the platform has violated your copyrights. In this case, uh, the Scientologists were complaining that Xenu had published specific um, Scientology texts at some of its URLs. And Google, in response, had taken down the whole Xenu.net site. Um, and Slashdot, which used to be a big uh, community uh, place, um, had just gone crazy uh, because um, this was a, a mistake. This was something that Google didn't have to do. Um, it was against, against generally what Google was doing at the time, which is they weren't taking down a lot of search results. Um, and uh, no one could figure out why they had done it. Um, and they were trying to decide what to do about all that. Um, and so that was when I had worked with uh, the brilliant Wendy Seltzer um, at Harvard, and she had come up with this thing called Chilling Effects, which is now the Lumen database of uh, takedowns. Um, and it was the first time that we suggested to Google that a good way of handling these things would be to be, to be very transparent with the users as to why a particular thing was being removed from search results and to put in the search result page, hey, there's a result missing. And here is the complaint that got us to, um, to take down that result. Um, and then that really helped the feedback loop be better because of course these platforms are gonna to make tons of mistakes and those mistakes are gonna have significant real world consequences. In this case, making it much harder for people to find this entire site of Scientology criticism. Um, but making it faster so that you could unearth the mistake and correct it. Google um, quickly put back up most of the Scientology uh, pages, except the ones that were claimed to have violated copyright, um, was another helpful thing that came with the added transparency as well. So that was really my first time uh, with Google um, and uh, in doing that type of thing. So this is like an early data void, almost. It was, it was scary because um, Google was just starting to be the thing that most geeks used to uh, to search the internet, so it felt like, um, especially to the geeks, that Xenu disappeared, mm. and that there was a company that had the power to make something disappear. Of course, that's not what was happening, mm -hmm. um, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. Um, and I think um, you know, throughout its throughout platform's history, they're sometimes slow to realize the amount of power that they have, um, and not just actual power, but apparent power within communities. Um, and so. Being more transparent was a helpful way to at least start the explaining of why particular things were happening. Um, it also is classic in that so much of this early stuff was copyright related. Um, and that was because a lot of the copyright uh, lawyers uh, got into the game of sending notice and takedowns uh, really early. And there was a clear law on both what had to be in one of those notices and what the companies should do if they wanted to maintain the safe harbor that the DMCA, which is Section 512 of the Copyright Act, provided. Yeah, I'll, I'll build off that because, candidly, like, the start with Google is so far away from me now. I'm not sure I would remember the first content <laughs> issue I dealt with for them. Um, but, but I think it, just to frame this full conversation, right, it's, it's worth thinking through, like, Content moderation is not new. Content moderation goes back to message boards, sysadmins, and, and Steve Jackson games, right? Taking stuff down because it wasn't appropriate on the site or for whatever reason, users didn't want to see something on the site. And I remember one of my early clients was Craig Newmark. So Craig of Craigslist was his own sysadmin. He, he personally responded to every customer email 
um, including ones that were about content problems, right? And so these are sort of like the origins of trust and safety was really handled by people who were sysadmins in a lot of ways, or later on customer support people. Um, and so I'm, I'm so pleased to see it actually develop into a, the professional uh, that, that it's about to become or, or starting to become now uh, of people who are trained to think about content issues and, and the variety of ways that that bad actors can be on your platform. Um, but I, I agree with AMAC, which is like, I think the early one, the early content demands we saw, the disputes were user versus user very often, right? Like claims of defamation or claims of fraud or scam or things like that. Um, there were a lot of like, uh, what we call pump and dump message boards in, in the early days of the internet of, of trying to do um, sort of financial schemes on, online. Um, but eventually, because the DMCA was so effective on getting content down quickly, you saw you ended up seeing a rise of like copyright complaints and DMCA demands. Um, I think the the other areas where where things grew a lot were like um, having to deal with CSAM or sexual child sex abuse materials um, was also one where the law was super clear, where nobody wanted to have that on their site anyway, and so you saw the development of teams both to identify and quickly remove and the tooling that was necessary to do that generate very quickly uh, in, in the trust and safety areas. So kind of building off of that, Google rapidly expanded into a lot of new areas all around the world. Um, and I've spoken with you about this in the past, Nicole, you spoke about kind of the process of going into new areas and needing to learn new legal systems. Um, so I was wondering if you could both speak a little bit about what that was like um, and what it was like to suddenly kind of be the mediator between different cultural conflicts, if, um, if you can. Yeah, I, I mean, I, when we've talked before, Robin, I sort of described this convergence of things that happened in like the mid 2000s, which is, I think the the largest of it was um, the ability to do real images and and video and and deliver it quickly across the globe um, be, really came into its own. Part of that was about YouTube and, and other services, um, but but the ability to share content visually changed the game in a lot of ways. Um, it was also a time when the a new generation of countries um, joining the internet um, became real in terms of a market. So if you think about the first generation um, starting in like the mid 90s of, of countries that had real internet uh, markets, it would be the US, Canada, the EU, Australia, and Japan. So, so maybe 10 to 12 countries, um, all of which had fairly similar uh, rule of law norms fairly similar um, principles around free expression and privacy. But by the mid 2000s, you see internet penetration happening in a whole host of new countries that include Saudi Arabia and China and Russia and Vietnam um, and Turkey. And all of a sudden you're in a bunch of different legal but also cultural norms about what's okay for people to say to each other and behave with each other. And that to me was like this turning point of how do we really be a global platform that is genuinely available to people who don't agree with each other on, on some very fundamental things? And lawyers are often like we're designed to be really bad at that. I think it's worth pointing out. Like we, we, are, we are put through an education that is at most uh, country specific um, and often state specific, right? The exam at the end of our time is about a particular state law in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, so many of us don't have, um, like, first of all, it'd be absolutely impossible to be an expert on every local law in every jurisdiction all over the world, um, which is what you kind of need to be. Um, but second of all, like, that's just not what the going in assumptions of law schools are, or necessarily of lawyers. So getting up to speed really quickly on all of those things, um, and not just the legal norms, but the cultural norms, uh, was something often the, a person who was actually living in that country or um, uh, part of a group that the area of law was important to or the cultural norm was important to would be much better at telling you um, what was okay and not okay uh, than a you know, lawyer based in uh, uh, wherever we were based in uh, Palo Alto, California. 
That's super interesting. Um, so at the same time, Alex, you lawyers are kind of acculturated into a specific American viewpoint, but you've uh, said that content decisions beyond what was just legal and not legal were not dependent on First Amendment norms per se. Can you speak to some of the other value tensions that you and your teams grappled with when you tried to determine the right policy for each product? Yeah, I always think of the starting place of this as being more about what the product was trying to do and the value that users were hopefully going to get out of it, that, pe that we would deliver to people. Um, and that um, really to me, and the example I, I use usually is, is Google web search is a little bit like a library. Um, as a user, I really want Google web search to have pretty much everything in it. Um, and I'm going to be mad when it doesn't have my weird little piece of Arcana. So I really like uh, Ultimate Frisbee. Um, if it doesn't have a particular uh, funny rule for a game that I like to play in the rain that I had seen before, that is going to make me angry. Um, at the same time, I don't care about college football, um, but Google search having a whole bunch of college football uh, is not going to uh, make me angry. Um, and there are, uh, are pieces that are more, uh, that more of the country uh, doesn't want. Uh, you know, for example, some alt-right uh, screed that its existence in Google web search, at least for me, does not um, uh, upset me. At the same time, Facebook is a little bit more like a dinner party, or at least it was uh, back in the day, where I'm less concerned about it having every little thing that I personally am interested in. And I'm more concerned with it not having the things that I don't care about. So if I go to a dinner party and someone's just droning on about American college football, that's not a good experience for me. Um, it's okay if nobody ever talks about ultimate, right? Like that's, that's fine. I understand that I'm weird. Um, but, the, but the American football thing, fine. And if someone's talking, you know, all right, baloney, uh, I am like leaving, right? So the, the types of things you might want to get out of the particular product to me were more what drove how we thought about the types of policies in terms of content regulation that we would be interested in against, of course, the backdrop of what is legal and illegal and the First Amendment giving us a lot of space to play. Um, and same with freedom of expression in many other countries. But, um, but the, 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 that's just the backdrop to a more narrow question of these policies aren't policies for their sake. They are designed to further a particular set of uses of the product mm -hmm. um, or the platform. Um, and to, at the end of the day, hopefully deliver a certain type of good and minimize a certain type of harms to people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I think that's where I, that when I was getting into that disagreement about whether the First Amendment was so controlling, um, that's what I was really thinking through mm -hmm. was it, it, it's not like we were um, uh, um, getting into particular First Amendment doctrine on thinking up the, the content regulation. Rather, that was the backdrop rules and we were trying to design something that would work. I think, I think that's totally right. And, it, and I think it also, but it does inform because so many of these very dominant platforms were built here, right? By founders who grew up in an environment where the First Amendment and this notion of a, a marketplace of ideas and a bunch of the things that come with that um, is built into their product and their vision for their product. So a lot of the work that I do these days is, is helping companies think through what are your content rules, but, but fundamentally, what are your principles? And, and it has to go, you, you start with what is the mission of your company and who do you serve, right? So to me, we're part of the difficulties that some of our US-based or at least founded in um, companies have had is they had these enormously ambitious missions, right? So Yahoo was the portal where all the world could come and find what they needed. And Google's was to organize the world's information and make it useful, right? And, or or uh, Facebook's is to build community and bring the world closer together. I, I, I building might build community, I still, I believe right now. Oh, yeah. well, like, I'm not exactly sure what it is today, but that's you know, like, <laughs> like global scope of, of bringing everything into one place. But I actually think that puts them in this really difficult position of trying to mediate 
a world which actually has many differences that is not going to get along. And so if you're trying to create a platform where all of that's going to work together, that's just an enormously difficult task, if not impossible task. Um, I do think, and, and this is sometimes where I, I get conversations with clients, like you don't have to be that, right? Like you can define your product in a way that serves your users but isn't have, doesn't have to run into some of these more difficult questions from content. So I think LinkedIn is enormously successful being the professional network it is. And some things are not appropriate at LinkedIn and everyone's okay with it being taken off because that's not what they're there for. I think Pinterest is in that same bucket in a lot of ways. Disney gets to be Disney. Mm -hmm. Disney doesn't have a lot of porn because they're not, that's not their mm -hmm. thing. And I need to expect that and encourage that, that the platforms can be the narrow thing, not everything. So like, in response though, in my work, I'm seeing platforms, especially they try and kind of grapple with a lot of the more difficult gray area concerns. Concerns that might not be legal issues, but are definitely ethics issues and are definitely issues um, where the public interest has raised um, some important, uh, it, where, where the public interest is at stake. But they're kind of leaning on some American values. They're using terms like legalism, precedent, free speech, federalism, to explain what they do. Can you give a little bit of insight into why legal teams would kind of fall back on that as they're trying to navigate these kind of messier areas of content concerns? So looking at basically the Facebook oversight board and this kind of Supreme Court type um, function where they're going to be creating rules and that rule system is going to serve as a bot as a system of precedent. So how can creating those structures like help decide these issues going forward, basically? And just to take the face board oversight board, whatever that is getting created um, as an example, right? Like to me, like what the value of it may be as it, as it comes together, right? Is one transparency mm. to of the company and the way it understands complaints and processes complaints. Um, and, and so it, it, I, I, it maybe a court system or a quasi court system feels like the right way to air those concerns as well as um, lay out the argument in a clear way. Um, and that certainly has a bunch of lawyer bias in it, by the mm -hmm. way. <laughs> but like, so, so one transparency um, value that serves in it. I also my, my feeling is, and this gets about a little bit of what we're talking about, which is these are platforms that are trying to mediate a lot of different cultural values and norms, right? And, and I think that's a really good thing to have happen. We don't do it often enough and we don't, hmm. we aren't talking about it in an honest way about how hard it is. Mm -hmm. and, and so if it creates, if, if those kind of structures create a forum for that, what that gets us closer to is some sort of norm system that we can Right, and we need a place to have that conversation. Anything to add, Alex? No, I thought that was great. Okay. So lastly, before I move uh, on to my final question, so where is the impetus coming for tech companies to address broader ethics concerns? So is it coming from pressure from advertisers, media, users, advocacy groups, um, or does it come internally within the company? Do you want me to start on this one, Nicole, since you did the last one? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the, the, it's funny, you know, I would put uh, the a, a group that you didn't mention as top at the top of my list there, which is it's coming from employees ah. um, and uh, in particular engineers. Um, um, I think at a lot of the companies that Nicole and I have worked at, uh, engineers are the most powerful uh, folks at the company. Um, and uh, these changes often do come from them. Now, granted, they come from them because uh, you can look at all the uh, diversity and inclusion surveys of these companies uh, and uh, the um, Silicon Valley remains overwhelmingly um, white, uh, overwhelmingly male. Um, there are plenty of, uh, of work that, that um, the companies need to do in terms of diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. But the, so it's not all coming from them because they just don't have the, the experience uh, the lived experience to catch a lot of the important ethical concerns. So a lot of it is coming from users and advocacy groups and stakeholder groups and uh, just uses trial and error. Um, but then it's percolating back up. Um, the, 
there is, um, at a lot of the companies, there is no such thing as a department of ethics. Mm. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, like in um, Google's case, that was very aggressively uh, attempted to be um, something that everybody uh, was involved in, and then maybe legal was a backstop. Um, I think other companies, the one I really, uh, the model I really like here is uh, uh, Dropbox. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but when uh, Ramsey Homesteady was there as the general counsel, he was also uh, had a, an, uh, an ethics title that was separate and apart from his legal title. Um, because I think that the, the good thing about lawyers and ethics is that we have struggled with some of these questions in the past. Uh, the bad things is that we often fall back to what is legal being what is ethical when actually they are two very, very, very different things in a lot of cases. Um, and so I liked the fact that Dropbox actually had the two different titles as a way of saying, if something happens that is perfectly legal, but grossly unethical, that is still Ramsey's job to make sure it doesn't happen. Mm. Um, and having, having some combination of the Google, any person, can pull the lever and say, hey, I think this, what we're doing here is wrong. Um, and the, but there is a buck stops here person uh, that, uh, that Ramsey was at Dropbox. I think some, some combination of that is probably a good, uh, a, a better way forward. It's very interesting. Um, so Alex, you just co-founded a professional association for trust and safety and Nicole, you're an advisor. Um, so can you tell us a bit about what you're trying to accomplish with this organization and um, who's allowed to join? So is it just policy or is it um, the thousands of people who are often enforcing uh, content rules as well? And what issues are you hoping to address with this? Yeah, so there's there's two things uh, that we that we founded. I should say this is um, myself, but really uh, Adeline Kay and uh, Clara Tao, uh, Tao and Eric Goldman and Danelle Dixon Thayer. Uh, this is, um, a, it's a group of people and the Trust and Safety Professional Association is designed to be focused on our members, which will be the trust and safety professionals writ large. Mm -hmm. So that's everyone from the person working as a contractor um, for another company that works for another company that works for Facebook doing content removals um, to the people who are setting the policy back at Facebook headquarters. Um, uh, just to pick on Facebook for a moment. Uh, but it's also the trust and safety teams at um, uh, places like Etsy and um, Airbnb, places that, um, that are often not thought of in the same context, um, but are doing this trust and safety job. Um, and to me, the biggest thing there is that's a job that has been going on for a lot of years. There are people who are really, really, really good at it and have developed a lot of experience and wisdom and it'd be, it'd be great if there was a place for them to share uh, their experiences and practice um, and a place that would help support them through the many unique challenges that they have. Everything from like, how do you look at uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of pieces of child abuse material um, and uh, deal with that on a personal level? Um, to what do you think about, how do you deal with career advancement? Um, in this uh, in this profession, um, so that's the Trust and Safety Professionals Association, and we just got off the ground. Um, we have tons of work to do, including finding an executive director, which um, uh, we have a job rec on the site. Um, and then the second part of it is the Trust and Safety Foundation, and this is a project of the Internet Education uh, Foundation. And there, our focus is broader than just the the people who are doing the work, but more broadly into trust and safety. How do we um, help uh, the, the bigger population um, understand it better? How do we get more research about it uh, out into the world? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's uh, you know, another sort of exciting part. It's a little bit less developed, um, but we'll be, uh, we'll be developing that more over the coming months. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I am so excited about the work that, that Alex and Adeline and Clara have been doing because we saw a similar thing happen with um, privacy professionals, right? Where there, for, for those who may not remember, there was a time where like a privacy lawyer wasn't a thing, that, that's not a job. Um, and it wasn't really until it was created as a job title, um, it was given uh, its own professional association that you started to see both 
people being able to find their network, um, a community that could discuss best practices, um, and it gave them standing within their companies to be able to be the trained person who could speak wisely to an issue that the company was going to face, not just to do the job, but like actually be sort of their in internal expert. And I feel like trust and safety is in that place now and very much needs it. Um, again, because I think it came out of such disparate places from customer support to legal analysts to whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it will be boosted by this notion of shared, um, shared best practices and, and the, the standing of a profession um, that is trained and has expertise in a particularly difficult area that we actually really do need strong guidance in. And the one thing I, I would add to it um, is that like, it's not just about the substance of the work. This is, um, for, for those who have done content moderation, it is hard work and it is emotionally hard work. And so I think that the standards around what does the profile of a content moderator look like? How do we take care of them to make sure that they can have longevity in the profession? All of those are the types of things that an organization like TSPA can weigh in on um, as, as a collective. And I, I think that's enormously important. That's fantastic. Uh, okay, so I have more questions, but we have some that have are in the Q and A. So I'm going to move on um, and ask you questions that have been voted up by our community. So the first one's from Tarleton Gillespie. Um, he asks, "In what ways do a company's competing priorities push back against things that trust and safety teams see as important? How do those conflicts typically get resolved? When do, when does?" trust and safety tend to win that argument, and when do they not? Um, how has that changed over the time that you've worked in this field? You aren't gonna get an easy one from Tarleton, guys. <laughs> All of the questions that we should have addressed. <laughs> you know, going back to sort of what I was just saying, I think that trust and safety has frequently not had the seat at the table that they should. Um, in development of products um, for companies that are trying to push hard on getting something out into the world. Um, and I think that their, their increasing rise uh, as, as a uh, important constituency that speaks for the user um, has been really important. And, and so my experience is it, it depends a little bit company to company who wins, right? But, but if you're doing it right, um, the, the path that is best for your users is the one that should win. Um, and I don't, I, I wouldn't lay that necessarily at trust and safety or engineering or sales necessarily, but that's one of the roles of trust and safety to be able to speak to that, um, uh, that user advocacy. And I guess the only thing I would add there is I think from the outside, often, um, uh, people put trust and safety and revenue on somehow opposite sides of the table. Um, and I have never seen that happen. Um, not, not have I never seen uh, revenue beat trust and safety, but I, I've never seen the battle because when trust and safety is trying to figure out a particular problem, the revenue implications uh, honestly have never come up in the discussions that I've had. Um, now I haven't been in every company, blah, 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 but uh, I think the bigger the bigger issue is often just the types of thing, things that a company is working on and the time of engineers to launch stuff is constrained. And the question is, how do we rank the various things that we need to do for the users and for the community at large? And that's where, um, as Nicole suggests, I think trust and safety is much more getting a seat at the table uh, these days. And I think the more enlightened companies are actually giving trust and safety engineering resources to make fundamental product changes um, rather than just policies, um, which is, is really great. Yeah, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a limit of some of the, it's the business model um, critiques where some of the content concerns, from my research, it's very hard to tie directly just to the business model. Um, so a question from Gina Matthews. Um, Someone may have the right to, she's, she wants you to get your reaction. Someone might, may have the right to free speech uh, with their one mouth and body, but do they have the right to 20,000 bots to amplify their message? Do they have the right to use sock puppets to caricature those on the other side of an issue in a way that makes them appear ridiculous or extreme? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think the way that I've, I've been hearing this conversation come up, right, is you may have a right to speech but not reach. Mm. And, and I think that that's actually a really important area of conversation, both for platforms and for the, the users that are on it, which is um, how do we think about the use of bots on, on a system and what can we do technically to prevent it? Um, because I, I think that's actually a pretty hard thing to do. Um, not for all of it, but, but for some of the more targeted uh, campaigns. Um, I also think like uh, platforms need to think really hard about how they make their engines of surfacing content, um, what, it, what it surfaces and how it surfaces and, and how much user agency ought to be involved in, in, in that. Um, so I think that, get, that gets to a technical question as well. Uh, we have a really interesting question from Stephen Fox. He asks, how do we build accessibility features into product development rather than having them fall to a specific team, whether that's specifically trust and safety or not, to try and fix the gaps after launch? Should trust and safety be the guardians for inclusionary design? That is a great question. I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm gonna have a good answer on the last bit. Um, uh, whether trust and safety is the right place for inclusionary design. Um, they do have a lot of the skills for it, um, but, uh, but not always, um, uh, not always the, the understanding and the lived experience. Uh, and I think it's hard to replace that. I, I think honestly, if, if we did a better job in Silicon Valley of, um, of having uh, people with accessibility issues in our teams, we would do a better job of building accessible product, products. Uh, and there's no real way to get around that as the best thing we could do. Um, and the second best thing we could do is, is um, talk more to people uh, who have those issues because they're going to be the best people who are able to tell us what to do in terms of making our products more accessible. Um, for a lot of this stuff, it's, they're, not, uh, they're not unsolved problems, like we're not even doing the basics. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to how to better prioritize getting the very basic stuff that everybody should understand should be done in products in terms of accessibility uh, done. Yeah, Alex, I don't know if you remember, because it's kind of foggy for me. Like, I think at one point for product council, you know, you have a checklist of, have you looked at the copyright issues? Have you looked at the privacy issues? And, and I thought accessibility used to be one of the things that we would look at, right? So if you're yep. if product council and you're involved at the design stage of a product, and in theory, you've raised, or you're raising at that point, the accessibility question. I do think, in my experience, right, that frequently gets lost because there's not a continuing um, person on the team for development to make sure it actually crosses the finish line. But, but if you were designing the process well, you're hopefully catching it earlier and not like before or after the thing goes out the door. Yeah, I, and I do, I do think, uh, you know, speaking, personally here that um, regulation in this space might be good. So Beverly asks, what kinds of backgrounds are helpful in your view going forward to build robust trust and safety teams and organizations? Is this a place where philosophy grads can go? <laughs> is that part of the question or is that your add-on? No, that's my add-on. <laughs> <laughs> I may or may not have a degree of philosophy, but yeah. Um, I, I mean, the biggest thing, the biggest driver that I've seen in terms of people being successful here um, is empathy, uh, attention to detail, um, and a, a fairly, um, uh, an ability to deal with very difficult things and very difficult conversations um, because this job is, is just very hard. There's no sugarcoating a uh, even some of the easier ones, which are people uh, you know yelling at, yelling at each other online. So the um, so I think those three things would be what I would look for. Um, and within the team, having people with uh, a diverse set of backgrounds would be extremely useful. Um, and in terms of some of my personal regrets over time, have been not uh, not pushing harder on that particular lever. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Because it sounded like the question was asking what kind of like educational or experiential background do you need? And I think it's a little 
bit less of that and more about the traits you have, which I agree with Alex, like attention to detail, empathy is huge and, and, and a resiliency because you, you, you get yelled at and sometimes completely unjustified, right? <laughs> but, but yelled at and have to not only be able to take that and, and transform it into something productive, but sometimes escalate it, right? Within either your managerial um, ladder or into the legal department or, or engineering department and give them some bad news about like, this is really bad uh, and, and we should fix it for the user. And I think that that kind of leadership is also one of the things you end up looking for for the, the managers in, in those functions. It's also something we're trying to explore at the foundation and at the um, association, the Trust and Safety Professional Association, is are there particular courses or things that would be useful for people to start to learn to be able to get into the profession? Um, and with the Copia Institute, we developed a bunch of case studies of some of the things that have happened already because this is not a blank slate so that we can learn from our mistakes and, and uh, not make them again and again. So a question from Sarita, uh, she says, the story you've told about sysadmins to trust and safety is about making informal tacit knowledge tacit. But as the point about diversity suggests, that tacit knowledge is white and male, even while those who are doing the labor of content moderation, e.g. Apl applying the rules or not. How do you value the labor and expertise of these latter people and black and brown people more generally going forward? Second question, the term user is very broad. How do you de determine which user to listen to when they're saying conflicting things and have differential access to power? States versus uh, community groups? Great question, Srita. Yeah, those are really great questions. I, I mean, in, in the first one, I think it's, we need to diversify this workforce. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things I would hope TSPA would, would be focused on. But I, I think that finding people from a wide variety of, of backgrounds and experiences, including black and brown people is, is essential to starting to get this right. I think in my experience, and I think it's because of the time maybe that I was most deeply in this and hiring for it, right? A lot of my focus was on hiring a team that had language capability because you're serving 170, 80 countries and you have need dozens of languages. And so in my brain, and this was my, my fault, right? My, in my brain, I was trying to figure out sort of the global diversity of my workforce um, so that I would understand a content issue in India versus Turkey versus Australia. Um, but I think that what has clearly become the case in the last several years is we actually need to diversify the, the teams within the countries or, or, or their regions. Um, on the second one, okay, wait, now I've forgotten the second question, but it was a really important one. Oh, who's the user? Um, so, and, and Alex may have a, a different take on this. I think one of the most difficult but interesting spaces that I've seen in content moderation in the last few years is trying to account for the people who are not the users on your platform trying to account for harms that happen off your platform because of something that starts on your platform. Um, and so I think who's your user depends a lot on your company mission and what your product is for and all of that. But I, I think that one of the really interesting things to wrestle with for trust and safety teams these days is how do I deal with harms that happen outside of, of my service in particular, not even for users of my service. Yeah, I, I, amen to what um, uh, to all of what Nicole said. Um, the particularly the distinction between users and non-users being uh, hopefully something that is being pushed uh, these days as these platforms become more and more impactful in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I would say one of the things um, that uh, that happened as we launched or that we did as we launched um, the Trust and Safety Professional Association is even in that launch, we didn't do a good enough job of having representation um, from uh, African-American and um, uh, particularly from Latino and Latina communities. Um, and we're working on that thanks to some very good um, folks who pointed it out to us. Um, but that, um, that's an important uh, thing to happen uh, and is important in the profession as well. The, the only thing I would push back a little bit on is um, uh, at least my understanding of this profession is that women are actually fairly well represented within the profession um, and in positions of power within the profession. Um, there, uh, there may still be uh, systemic problems with how we treat the input from those women in power in the profession, um, but the representation is certainly there. 
Uh, and so I'm, I'm not sure uh, saying that most of the sensibilities are white male, at least from within the profession, um, quite gets to the root of the, of the issue as well. So there's a ton of really great questions uh, in the chat, but we are, um, we are at time now. Um, I don't even know if we have, if you guys have some very quick closing remarks about your hope for the field going forward, um, I'd love to hear them now um, before we close up. Nicole, why don't I go first? Cause you're more eloquent than I am. Uh, and then that way you can close the whole thing off. But um, I think one of the things that I am most excited about, Nicole spoke about uh, the marketplace of ideas and sort of the, this fundamental framing of the best way to encourage wonderful discourse, including political being this uh, First Amendment or freedom of expression type of framing, which the marketplace of ideas has been historically a very big part of. Um, and the questioner was asking a question that I, uh, on the bots, especially, um, that I think is one of the avenues that we've seen for the limits of that type of understanding of the best ideas will win out and get the most airtime and, and become the dominant ideas. I think that's often not the case in our current um, society. And so some of the things that I'm most excited about is as we have um, many more people from many different backgrounds, um, and I don't just mean um, uh, uh, racial and ethnic here, I also mean like just academic backgrounds uh, coming at uh, these issues. We are seeing, I think, a, uh, and we will see a fundamental rethinking of the, the marketplace of ideas of how freedom of, exp of expression ought to be thought of in this new uh, digital space. Uh, and that's what excites me most. Uh, sort of rewriting some of the basic DNA about how we think through ways of having great uh, conversations uh, online. Mm. That's so good. Um, so uh, I could nerd out on this all day. So thank you, Robin and Data and Society and AMAC for, for putting this together because it, it was such a great uh, discussion. Um, I guess this is such a hard time to be doing this work, especially with what we're sort of calling the tech lash. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it feels to me like all the companies are on their back foot being in a really defensive crouch trying to manage through it at a time when I actually think it is most important for us to be having an honest conversation about how hard the job is, mm -hmm. about the social, like the real social questions that we have to answer because the, the truth is there's a bunch here that is terrible and that tech will never fix because tech didn't create. Misogyny and racism and anti-Semitism and, and state warfare, those are things that are sort of outside of what tech can fix. So, so what I would love to see, right, is, is a credible voice bringing that conversation to the table, but also with real ideas about what we can fix, right? Like we don't have to have an engagement algorithm that accelerates all this terrible stuff. We don't have to create filter bubbles that, that exacerbate polarization. And so to me, the, the, um, the professionalization of a trust and safety group um, and, and all the lawyers and all the other folks at, at the companies who are, who are working towards these products have an obligation to really engage in that conversation, but do it honestly and, and not pretend that they have the tech solution, it's just one more AI algorithm away, right? Like, let, let's have the honest conversation about what we can and can't fix. I think that's a fantastic way to close this out. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you again to Alexander and Nicole for sharing your expertise. Please visit our website and sign up for the Data and Society events list for future programming. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Robin. Bye, guys.